All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Each Tuesday, there is a team voting event in the office that involves puzzles and games. Whoever wins the event is allowed to leave work early on Wednesday. This has led to a consistent increase in performance at these events. What consequence had led, has led to this increase? When you get a consequence question, if you're prepared, it should be a very straightforward process. We know consequences affect future behavior, so we ask ourselves, how has this consequence changed behavior? Well, we know Whoever wins the event gets to leave work early. As a result, there's a consistent increase in performance at team building events. So the behaviors have increased. So we're looking at some sort of reinforcement. Now, is it positive or negative? Positive means something was added. Negative means something was taken away. In this case, we have a team building event in the office that involves puzzles and games. If you win the event, you get to leave work early on Wednesday. So you get to escape work. You get to leave. So you are being reinforced through negative reinforcement. Whenever something's reinforced through escape or avoidance, think negative reinforcement. So A and B, positive reinforcement and positive punishment. Well, we've settled on negative because it involves an escape of work. So C is gonna be our answer, negative reinforcement. And then D, negative punishment. Since the behavior has increased, it's going to be reinforcement. What has led to the change or the increase? C, negative reinforcement. Every time you go through a toll booth on a toll row, you give your money to the teller and they open the gate. You've been doing this for years and have never once gotten through the gate after giving your money. What type of schedule are you on? So let's think about this. It's a basic reinforcement schedule. You have to know basic reinforcement schedules. They are on our task list. So just because they're simple doesn't mean we neglect it. Even the easy questions, even the easy terminology, you have to know. In this case, you go through a toll booth, you give your money, you go through the gate. Every single time you do this, you get rewarded. You have never once not gone through the gate after giving your money. So again, you go through the toll booth, you give your money, you get through the gate. What type of schedule is that? Are you being reinforced for responses or based on time? Well, responses. If you give your money, you get through the gate every time. So if we look at A, continuous, that's going to be an FR1. Continuous schedules are FR1s. Every response is reinforced. In this case, every single time you give money, you get reinforcement. You are on a continuous schedule. What about B, a fixed ratio schedule? Well, since you are on a continuous schedule, you've also got to be on a fixed ratio schedule. What about C, fixed interval? Since your reinforcement is based on responses and not time, it can't be an interval schedule. You are on both a continuous FR1 schedule and a fixed ratio schedule. So the answer is both A and B. Jamie often bites her nails, which is automatically reinforcing. Jamie asks her friend to observe her in intervals lasting 30 seconds each and to take partial interval recording data on the nail biting. Jamie bites her nails at 29 seconds for the first two intervals and then not at all for the next two intervals. How many responses should be recorded? So let's think about this. We have to decide how many responses we are going to record. We have a situation where we have 30 second intervals and we've got four intervals, right? Because we have two and then two. So one, two, three, four. And partial interval recording, if the behavior happens at all, we count it. So if Jamie bites her nails at 29 seconds in the first two intervals, that's going to count and that's going to count. If she doesn't do it at any point in the next two intervals, that doesn't count. So how many responses are we going to record? Well, two. The hardest part about the time sampling and interval recording is deciding what type of measurement am I using? Is it whole interval? Is it partial interval? Or is it momentary time sampling? A job coach is teaching a new employee to use a complicated piece of equipment. He starts by fully guiding the employee's hands through each step and gradually reduces physical assistance as the employee becomes more proficient. 
which prompting procedure is being used. So we have a prompting question and it's pretty straightforward, right? Job coach, teaching new employee, he's guiding employee's hands through each step. So fully guiding looks like full physical. He then starts to gradually reduce physical assistance as needed. So we start with full physical and then full physical and then work our way down to this more partial physical. As we're moving down the hierarchy, which way are we going? A, least to most. Well, if we're starting up here with full physical and then moving to partial, it's not going least to most, right? We're going to be going most to least. It is an errorless teaching. Just because we're using full physical doesn't necessarily mean it's errorless. We need to specify if errors are being prevented. Since they're not, we're not going to claim it's errorless. What it is, though, is most to least. We've gone from a very intrusive full physical prompt to a less intrusive partial physical prompt. And then prompt delay. Are we delaying the prompt at any point? Has the prompt been delayed? Are we giving the learner an opportunity to respond before prompting? There's no indication of a prompt delay in this scenario. So what most likely we are using is going to be a most to least prompting procedure. At first, Jim's friends love playing board games with him and would congratulate him when he won. Recently, Jim has gotten really good at the game, so his friends have not been nearly as congratulatory, so Jim has stopped coming to play games as often. What might be occurring? Now, we have another behavior change question, another consequence question. What do we know? It says, what might be occurring? What do we know so far? We know Jim's friends love playing boards game, board games with him and would congratulate when hit him when he won. So immediately, that should jump out. Now, Jim is good at the games, and his friends are no longer congratulating him. As a result, Jim is not coming to play as often. So we know Jim's behavior is doing what? Jim's behavior is decreasing. So this must be extinction or punishment. Now, in the past, James would get congratulated when he won. Now, he's not getting congratulated when he, when he wins. So what are Jim's friends doing? They're withholding reinforcement. And when we withhold reinforcement, what do we call that? A operant extinction of behavior maintained by positive reinforcement. Are we putting this behavior on extinction by withholding positive reinforcement? We are, right? Previously, congratulations would be given. Now they're no longer given. This is operant extinction. It's not respondent extinction, okay, because it's consequence extinction. Respondent does not have to do with consequences. It is not operant extinction of behavior maintained by negative reinforcement because we're withholding positive reinforcement. And it isn't punishment because we are withholding something, making it extinction. Make sure you understand the difference between extinction and punishment. They're two separate ideas. In this case, operant extinction of behavior maintained by positive reinforcement is occurring. The state fair announces that the five people with the most tickets at the end of the night win the grand prize. Vanessa knows that she can earn 10 tickets if she knocks over three milk bottles at a time and that she can earn 20 tickets if she can make four baskets in a row. So she swaps between activities to try and earn as many tickets as possible. What schedule is in place? Now for compound schedules, the sixth edition has simplified it a little bit. They will reduce the amount of schedules that you need to know. I recommend still learning them all, but there are four we have to focus on. And since they're a little more consolidated, it makes it a little easier to identify what we're looking at, especially in this case where we have choice because Vanessa can earn 10 tickets if she knocks over three milk bottles at a time, or if she makes four baskets in a row, she gets 20 tickets. So what does she do? According to matching law, right? She's going to swap between activities and maximize tickets. So she's making a choice. I can engage in certain behaviors to contact certain reinforcement schedules. And that schedule is concurrent. With Chained, we have schedules we have to complete in a certain order. Multiple and mixed schedules are two or more schedules for a behavior that are swapping or switching between one another. Not the case here, right? This is a choice schedule. This is going to be concurrent. Tom, following a functional analysis, designs a behavior intervention plan that targets reduction of aggression in a 12-year-old client. The intervention is successful at reducing aggression and at, in and at increasing functional communication. 
What goal of behavior analysis is represented here? All right, another goal question. What are our goals? Description, prediction, control. Description, we are describing what happens. A description would be, Tom says the client engages in aggression. We're just describing what happens. Prediction, we are making a correlation. Uh, correlation would be, Tom says the client engages in aggression because they can't communicate. That's a prediction. Control is when we're actually intervening and experimenting and establishing functional relationships. Since Tom is using an intervention and is successful, Tom has demonstrated some form of control. There's a functional relationship occurring. What is the best example of habituation? Okay, pretty straightforward learning question. What is habituation? Habituation is typically associated with respondent conditioning when we have a stimulus reflex association. And every time the stimulus occurs, the reflex occurs. So let's say you hear a loud clap of thunder and you jump. Habituation says the more you hear that thunder in a short period of time, the less intense the reflex becomes. So what here is the best example of habituation? A ticking clock annoys you at the beginning of the semester, but eventually you don't notice it at all. So the ticking clock is our stimulus. And as you're repeatedly exposed to it, you start to ignore it completely. So this is an example of, of habituation. A toddler starts to cry louder each time they are not allowed to buy a toy at the grocery store. This is not habituation because this has to do with the consequence. When they cry or when they ask to buy a toy, they are told no, so they start to cry. This is not an example of habituation. C, a woman walks slower through clothes stores that she especially likes. This is also an example of consequence chosen behavior, which is operant and not related to habituation. Habituation is the repeated introduction of a, a presentation of a stimulus, which reduces the intensity of the reflex. In this case, it's going to be the ticking clock annoying you, but as you hear it more and more, that intensity goes down. American Ninja Warrior is a competition where athletes compete in a giant obstacle course to see who can score the fastest time. The athletes all compete on the same course, which features various obstacles that must be completed in the order that they are presented prior to hitting the button at the end to end their run. What type of schedule does this resemble? All right, we have another reinforcement schedule question. Let's think about this, right? Again, should be much more straightforward and easy to identify these type of schedules. This situation where it's a giant obstacle course, you have to get the fastest time, and the athletes must compete, do all the obstacles in the order they are presented prior to hitting the button. So if we have to engage in schedule after schedule in a certain order, what is that going to be? Well, that's clearly going to be a chain reinforcement schedule question. And that's why your compound schedule questions are going to be easier, or they should be this time around, because you're just identifying, am I looking for a choice that's concurrent? Is there a certain order that's gonna be chained? Or if there are multiple schedules for one behavior that are rotating, then it's mixed or multiple. In this case, we are looking at a chained schedule. Which of the following is true about an abative effect in terms of motivating operations? When it comes to motivating, motivating operations, we have abolishing and establishing effects and then evocative and abative effects. When we talk about evocative and abative effects, we're talking about temporary changes in behavior. Abative effects do what? Abative effects reduce or suppress current behavior, and abative effects are typically associated with abolishing operations. So if you look at A, an abative effect alters how often the behavior occurs in the current moment. That is true. Abative effects affect current behavior temporarily. B, an abative effect alters how often behavior occurs in the future. That is not true. We're not talking about future behavior. C, an abative effect makes the consequence less valuable. That is an abolishing operation or an abolishing effect, not the abative effect. And then D, an abative effect also functions as a function altering effect. It does not. An abative effect is temporary and deals with current behavior. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. 
check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.